Nicola Duaran uh, was one of the real founders of developmental neurobiology. She's easily the, the most important woman scientist model that I ever had. And she was fearless and imaginative and creative. People always talk to me about being the first person in science and, and at this stage or that stage and what it meant to be the only woman in the department or whatever, but I think the broader question of what it meant to be a scientist in society as a woman in the 60s and 70s and 80s is almost more profound. The first night I was at Rockefeller, uh, they were opening this building and it was a, unbelievably beautiful party for the for Mr. Rockefeller's birthday and the celebration of the building. I was introduced to Pamela Harriman and she was the grand dame of Washington society both intellectually and socially. And Mr. Rockefeller, you know, said that I was the first woman appointed here and her response her response was you look so normal. And uh, that was hurtful, and and that kind of thing happened to me a lot, and uh, still does sometimes. Everybody talks about how much they love Mad Men, not me. You know, I lived through it. I grew up in Virginia on the sea coast, and uh, I had two brothers. We would come home and play outside, or go down to the river, and and collect things. You know, we were outdoors all the time. My mother and grandmother were both master gardeners, so I spent a lot of time digging in the earth, which was probably a prelude to me culturing cells now. I think my favorite teacher was called Mrs. Little, and she was indeed about four foot 11. We would come in in the morning, and she had us do this wonderful exercise that I still think about, which was we had to reach our hands as high as we could, reach for the stars, and always remember you can do anything you can dream of. It's making me teary now because it's sort of uh, amazing to remember. And uh, she was the first person to show me a microscope. And so that Christmas I, I, I asked for a microscope for Christmas. I can't thank my mother enough because uh, she wasn't the least interested in science. But if it was something that interested me, it interested her. So she bought me incubators and all kinds of stuff and, you know, let me turn the garden house into a place to do experiments and stuff. Uh, the first book that I remember reading uh, that had just a profound influence on me was Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. That was very important to me and that, that really got me interested in biology. That and the other thing was that the space program, Langley Field, was in the town where I lived. So I met the astronauts when I was seven or eight. And uh, that's one of the most vivid memories of my childhood. I, the Mercury astro astronauts, the, the program had just formed. But I, I went out and we were all meeting them. And you know, you were hoping they would notice you. And uh, I don't know if you know it, but John Glenn is a redhead. And so he, he immediately saw me and, uh, and came over to me and said, hi, Red, how are you doing? So, uh, so that was great. Before the Beatles, there was the astronauts. Those guys were the rock stars of my youth. It was pretty important, actually, and at the time, it sounds silly now, but nobody knew, and that is if you go into space with no gravity, will the bacteria and viruses overgrow everything and kill the astronauts? Nobody knew that, so, so my project was to de design a system where we could test whether bacteria grew differently in different gravity uh, states. I won a Westinghouse for this, and, the, and the, the experiment flew on an Apollo mission. And I was working there at NASA the night that Apollo 13 landed on the moon. I think people now can't quite grasp how exciting it was to be able to go to space and how dangerous it was and how, you know, we were, we were all living uh, this action movie. And, uh, didn't know how things would turn out.
I came to the cerebellum as a cell biologist because I thought it offered a lot of advantages, both for cell biology, so I could do the thing I love the best, which is watching what the heck they're doing, and molecular biology, which I came to love more and more. I've always been interested, you know, whether it was when I was a child looking in my little tiny microscope from the stuff in the pond, you know, what are they doing? And uh, why are they doing that? It turns out there are very fundamental principles about why they why they do that, and it's critical to the development of the brain. But I was also interested in how they move. The word glia means glue, and uh, there are neurons in the brain, and then the glia are basically the other cells. We figured out how to purify the neurons in the glia, and then we could recombine them. And when we recombined them, the glia made these nice long ropes, and it looked like the neurons were migrating on them. I went to see it. It sounds nuts now, but we were the first to put a video camera on top of the microscope. And you could watch them migrate. It was a very big deal because the static images had been used to infer that neurons migrate on glia, but this was the proof. The first video I made of neurons migrating was the night before John was born. I was in the lab trying to keep myself busy, and I saw, saw them migrate. I mean, it, if you looked at the still picture, it looked like that's what they were doing, but it's like the difference between a picture of Federer and watching him play, you know, it's totally different. Jim Edmondson did that work and his, his 1987 paper is a very famous paper because that was the paper that presented the video microscopy. And in the developing cortex, what was exciting was um, the cortex develops from a tube and all of the uh, neurons are, are born on the inside of the tube and they have to walk out through the wall. They move uh, kind of like a little inchworm, and the wall gets thicker and thicker as more neurons are added. And so it's about like walking from New York to Chicago. It's not trivial. And the glial cells put one foot on one side and one foot on the other side, and they stretch a kind of uh, rope-like uh, cell across. And the neurons use, use this as a um, highway to, to migrate on. So the glia are very important. I mean, over 30 years, we've learned a huge amount about how and it's a very unique form of locomotion. It uses unique adhesion proteins, which we discovered, and uh, it's very critical for proper brain development. We also did experiments there where we looked at migration in different regions of the brain. So the main theory around in those days was that the, if there's migration, then the glia are setting it up. So it's kind of like a problem of a car on the interstate highway. Where's the information? Is, is the highway telling you where to go or is the neuron just a car on the highway? So we did this wonderful experiment, which I'm very proud of, which uh, my first female postdoc did. Her name was Renata Fishman. Glial fibers are very tiny. They're only a micron in diameter. So we figured that if we could make a, something a micron in diameter that was artificial, we could tell whether it was glia or whether it was some protein on that thing. So we searched and I searched and searched and searched for where to get a one micron glass fiber. And one night I was doing a, a, a filtering experiment and the filter is made of glass fibers. And I, I was, you know, I was waiting for the stuff to go through the filter and I was reading the reading the label because anything else to do. And it says it was, you know, it's made of one micron glass fibers. So then we did the really complicated thing of taking a stir bar and just smashing up the, uh, smashing up the uh, filter. So Renata did this wonderful experiment where we just purified these nice fibers and we put the adhesion proteins that by now we had identified, but we also put adhesion proteins that are not in the nervous system, that are in skin, other stuff on these fibers. And what we found was if you put the correct protein on, it migrated perfectly well. And if you put the wrong one on, as long as it was adhesive, they could migrate on that too. And so the two kinds of experiments, taking neurons on a walk on glia from other regions of the brain and doing these glass fiber experiments proved a fundamental feature of migration. That is the instructions are in the neuron and not in the glial fiber. So then you begin to look at changes in the, in the neuron uh, and how you know, the circuit is built as, as these layers of the brain are built. So 
that was really exciting and a big deal. That was happening right at the transition time as I was coming, coming here. When I came to Rockefeller, they asked me to give a talk to the Board of Trustees. David Rockefeller was there and he listened very patiently. He was an incredibly intelligent person and he knew a lot about science because in those days he was here a lot. And he listened very patiently and he said, well, that's very interesting, Mary Beth, but why would the young neuron want to leave the place where it was born? It's a question that we're still grappling with and, it, and only now in some of the chromatin stuff we're doing to, have we begun to have insight into that. I still wonder if I'll ever be able to rigorously answer Mr. Rockefeller's question. I think um, basic science is, is a, a very creative enterprise. So I think part of it is just imagining worlds where we don't actually live. I think writing is the same, you know, authors imagine things in a different way. They create a world that's, that's different and then by writing the novel, they walk into the world and inhabit it. And I think, I think that's what scientists do. More often than not, the moment that you make a huge discovery is the moment you realize you're wrong and that you've been totally wrong about the way you think about something. And if you look at it a different way, it has completely different meaning. And um, then you make, you know, a discovery. Oh, it's unbelievably exhilarating. It's unbelievable. It's, it's in, in my life, it's, you know, one of the greatest highs that I've ever experienced. It's liberating. I think writers would feel the same way, you know, that they, they struggle and struggle and struggle and then write a new world and suddenly nothing is like what you knew before.